So this is a little quick video I made. I didn't know if I was gonna make it back in time. <laughs> so this is a quick video I made last week for you guys. So it's just like two minutes, we'll just play it, and then if anybody's straggling, we can start after they get here. Hey guys, welcome to ESRM. We're here in the back of uh, Glacier Bay in Alaska. And so this area, if you look behind me, is actually a glacier. It looks gray behind me. But that area, um, uh, it's still a glacier, still leaking in, but we're at the edge of the bay. When John Muir came here uh, 120 years or so ago, um, we were another uh, 20, uh, well, about another five miles, 10 miles that way of, of solid glacial ice. Um, 100 years before that, it was, a, it was another 60, 60 miles or so now. So these glaciers have been rapidly degrading, rapidly retreating. Of all the glaciers in Alaska, more than 10,000, only eight are accreting. The rest are, are disappearing, as with most of the glaciers on Earth. This is a great example of the, some of the impacts we have on our planet. This is the kind of stuff we're interested in the answer. So we're super stoked that you guys are joining us. And uh, and we love uh, tackling hard challenges. You guys love tackling hard challenges. So we're interested in being objective, but also really understanding all the stakeholders and all the challenges that are associated with these, with these problems. We think the science is important. We think the humanities are important. We think social sciences are important. We think all of these disciplines need to come together to help us solve crises like these eroding glaciers, sea level rise, uh, microplastics, pollution, uh, food supply, all that kind of stuff. And so you can only do that if you have this great interdisciplinary tra training. What we're going to do for you in ESRM is give you guys that interdisciplinary training. And so um, uh, I strongly encourage you guys to not only take a variety of classes, as many diverse classes as you can, but also to volunteer with us. Come up with us to some of our experiential learning classes in New Orleans, in Hawaii, in Costa Rica, up here to Alaska. And these are how you guys will get that deeper experience in that resume building, um, uh, uh, make your resume as nice and big and huge so that you can uh, be competitive for these kinds of jobs and these kind of positions and be in a point in your life, in your career, where you can make a difference. So thanks, you guys. And uh, I will uh, I'll see you guys soon. And we you guys have a great day. And I uh, encourage you guys to come to Glacier Bay, Alaska, when you get a chance. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about what we're doing and then give you a little bit of some suggestion, suggestions about classes to, to take and, and how to do that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're, so our full name of our program is Environmental Science and Resource Management, but no, virtually no one ever uses that term. Is that me? What the hell? Sorry. I think there's some other YouTube happening in my background. So. Um, so we created this program. There was none really like it when we created this, not, not um, our exact nature. And so we actually took two different terms and merged them together. So environmental science is something you guys have probably heard of. That's typically folks that measure pollution or quantify some aspect of the environment. Resource management is um, dudes, historically dudes, increasingly men and women, but historically it was dudes, on horseback, spitting, chewing a lot, and talking with people. And so it was more the social science. How do we get people to, to harvest the trees more sustainably? How do we get the farmers to use water more sustainably? That kind of stuff. And we merged the two because we think they both have um, had value. And so um, there's all kinds of places to learn about us. So the first thing I'll say is if you guys haven't explored ESRM Zone, you should do that. So that's our main website. There's a, the school has a default website, which sucks. And we have to have it because school is we have to have it. But it's hard for us to change it, and we can't do all the stuff we want to do with it easily. So a couple years ago, we started this website, and the students voted for the names. So that's the whole website. So it's esrm.zone, and you'll get to it. There's no .com or org or anything like that. And that's our main parking ground for uh, how-to videos, where we post job postings, um, that kind of stuff. So if you guys haven't explored that, take a few minutes today and go check that out. Um, that's sort of our main point of contact, blog posts, notes, and things of that nature. Um, and I, so I should have introduced myself. Man, I'm just going off. So I'm Sean Anderson. I'm the chair of the Environmental Science and Resource Management Program. Welcome, you guys. Um, uh, let's see, do I have it here? Yeah, so, so we are focused primarily here in Southern California, in coastal Southern California. But we do work all around the world. So these are we have projects in Hawaii, Cook Islands, Eastern Turkey, um, 
older projects uh, in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. We might just be, one of my colleagues is just getting back from Mexico. We might be starting a new class down there. Um, and older projects in Antarctica. A lot of work in Louisiana as well as California. And these are only my sites. So if we had all of our faculty on, it would be hard to see the map all the different places we work. So we're focused in California. But we definitely have a global perspective and we're definitely interested in things going on um, around the world. Um, we are really, really field oriented. So um, we have several students who have um, some mobility issues and stuff, and you don't have to go outside and to do all their stuff, but that's our, that's our main focus. So, so we're a field science. Um, we have a strong focus on research as well. And so, so we, we incorporate research throughout our classes. So even if you guys don't volunteer, I'll talk about volunteering in a bit, but even if you don't, uh, volunteer with us if you, if you quote unquote just take our classes we've baked experiences into our classes that you guys uh, that are really great for your resume and that really um, expose you guys to doing different things so for example in my coastal marine management class we do public opinion polling every fall we do um, we survey stores for how much seafood they're selling and, and what kind of seafood that is um, we survey beaches we all these different things we do um, really doing basic research. So that's not some activity for you to do, it is an activity for you to do, but, but it's also contributing to a larger data set. And so some of these data sets have been going on now for almost 20 years, and so it's a really cool opportunity for you guys to help out and um, be much more engaged with the community and, and, and the problems and the challenges and the solutions that we're, we're offering. In addition to that, one of the, another thing that distinguishes us is we have this senior capstone experience. That's a year-long requirement. Most not every major has a capstone requirement. Some it's optional. Um, and we're one of the only ones that have a year-long requirement. And ours is research-based. So some, some programs, um, it'll change for year to year. So this person is working on a cancer drug, or this person wants to do this historic study. Um, for us, you guys work in small groups, and you work for the whole year. And so you guys, this, you guys um, you might get some of the parameters for your project from some partners or some faculty, but you guys are in charge of getting all the data. You guys are in charge of evolving it. You guys are in charge of how frequently you sample and that kind of good stuff. And um, this is, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to map um, before, because I've been in Alaska for the last couple of weeks, but, but this was last year's, so, so not the school year, but the previous school years. But these are all the different sites that our students in our capstone class collected data. Obviously, almost everybody is focused right here around campus, which is totally cool. Many folks use our research station on Santa Rosa Island. We're the heaviest user of our Santa Rosa Island research station, our program. Um, but, but we work all over the place. And this year, there'd be dots in Hawaii, and there'd be dots in Louisiana as well, if we added this year's home to it. But this is, this is fairly representative of um, year to year stuff. In addition, we're really interested in things like environmental justice and getting you guys connected with communities, different, various communities. So one of the things we, we like to do is we like to teach classes where we act as a little mini environmental consulting firm and we go to a place and um, we do it here locally as well, but, but um, people seem to most know us from our, our far away classes we teach. And so we go there, in the case of New Orleans, we're working with a nonprofit in Costa Rica, we also work with some nonprofits. In the Cook Islands, we work with um, a local tribe, a local village, as well as the local government. In Hawaii, we work with the government and, um, and another nonprofit. And the idea is we go in, you guys come with us, we, we spend a semester learning about whatever the country or place or challenge, whatever it is, is. And then we go there and we collect data. So sometimes that's public opinion polling data, sometimes that's engaging with kids in terms of art, art projects and stuff. Um, in some cases, it's surveying crocodiles, in some cases, surveying um, plants, using drones to map cliff sides, all different kinds of stuff. These are all supported through our Instructionally Related Activities Committee. So you guys, I don't know if you've heard about that yet, IRA, everybody calls it IRA, IRA trips. I really, really encourage you guys, before you graduate, to do an IRA trip, ideally with us, but if not with us, do one of these things. So the rule of thumb is we'd love for everybody to do a semester abroad, but semester abroads can be expensive, and so we get that. And so um, to try to make sure that everybody has a chance to see something away, we've created these IRA things. They're funded by you guys. You guys all pay for them. All students pay a $50 a semester um, a fee, one of the fees you guys pay. And with that, 
professors can, from any program, can propose programs. And so the rule of thumb there is that you pay one third of the trip costs, school pays two thirds of the trip costs. So it's, you still have to pay some, but for example, my New Orleans class, students pay about 700 bucks. And that's for almost two weeks, and that's everything. That's airfare, food, lodging. Um, we do uh, the History of Louisiana through food. We meet with chefs. We meet with the mayor's office. We meet with the Pulitzer Prize winners. We install food gardens in neighborhoods that don't have access to healthy, uh, affordable food. And for about half the time, and the other half the time, we're doing wetland rest uh, uh, monitoring in support of some of our wetland restoration work. And then most nights we're out at jazz clubs or Zydeco bands and, and sort of embedding you guys in the culture of uh, New Orleans and Louisiana. And, and similar things happen in Costa Rica and Hawaii, et cetera. So love to talk with you guys about that. Um, also, I'd suggest uh, you guys should Google on my YouTube uh, channel, Google Sean Anderson, that's me, and ESRM. That's the easiest way to find it. And just start looking around. And we have um, videos from all these different experiences up there, as well as lectures. Well, I, most of my lectures I record. And so you don't have to watch my lectures, but I would encourage you guys to watch five minutes or so of a lecture or two just to get a sense of, of how we teach. Um, anyway, so we, we do a lot of community-based um, learning as well and research. And all of this is designed to have you guys supercharged by the time you graduate. So all this is designed to make sure you guys are totally marketable. So in college, there's a spectrum and there's always an argument and it's probably healthy to always have this argument. What is college supposed to be? So some people say college is supposed to be learning about yourself and, and reading all this great poetry and, and learning about the human condition, which is a cool thing. Other people on the other side of the spectrum say it's just supposed to be an engineering school. You're just supposed to learn the mechanics of doing the whatever job it is, you know, nursing or something that, you're, that you want to do. The reality is college should be both of those things. You, it, there's, there's a spectrum. On that spectrum, we definitely fall more towards getting you guys a job. Um, which jobs are there, like in ESR? Yeah, great question, great question. So, that was a perfect segue. Look at that, it's like a plant in it. Um, so th this is just a small subset. Um, I, yeah, small subset. So, so there's some of the traditional things, I work for the Park Service as a ranger or a scientist, work for California State Parks. A lot of our folks work for county government and sort of planning and, and geospatial making maps and things like that. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Defense, um, a lot in private consulting, um, locally as well as uh, elsewhere. Um, some of our students work for Caltrans, state agency. Um, increasingly, more and more of our students, because we build a lot of robots in our labs, so we build flying robots and swimming robots. In fact, that, and that black box is a swimming robot that we just loaned to UCLA. So UCLA just took it to the South Pacific to go measure some coral reefs. And I'm going to Florida uh, in two days. I'm trying to take that with me. But, but um, uh, we build really cool stuff. Uh, we don't so much build stuff from scratch anymore because it's not really cost effective. We'll tend to buy something and then tweak it. So in our labs, we have a bunch of 3D printers and drill presses and things that we, we um, uh, add things on these robots and we tweak it and do different tasks. So more and more of our students are actually going into the drone and robotics industry. So some of our students, a lot of our students, like three or four, last count, are working for this company called Pix4D that, that stitches photos together and makes three-dimensional representation stuff from, from uh, uh, still images uh, of Patagonia, a Limonera, which is a local farming community, Howling's another uh, local farming, uh, 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 where they grow tomatoes. Um, private foundations, um, uh, and I don't know how, probably like on the order of about nine, ten percent of our students go to education, and so a lot of those folks, some of them go to informal education, like work with the Park Service or something like that, but a lot actually go and get their teaching credential. Uh, city government, um, Coast Conservancy, uh, federal departments, local water districts, I just was at a resource conservation district yesterday where one of our students just got a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even with that, they didn't get a job, and they had to go back to school to get like, certain certificates to yeah. qualify for a job. Yeah. So with all these jobs, is there like, a number of miles between the community? No. No. So we're getting ready to roll out some new certificates. We were hoping to have them rolled out for this year, but they won't be for another year or two, which is fine for you guys. Um, but so we, we're different from most other programs in that we, we designed you guys 
and to, we've designed it with the skills and the preparation so that you guys are highly marketable. So, um, so real quickly, my undergrad I did at UCSB, and um, I uh, family didn't have a lot of money, so I had work to pay for school. I had to have four jobs at one point at the same time. It was kind of crazy. Um, and then I started volunteering in a lab, which is, which will get me to wanting you guys to volunteer. And started volunteering for free, and then eventually they started paying me, and they started paying me more. And then by the time I graduated, they hired me full time to run the lab. So I did that for a while. Went to Antarctica. So I'm, I'm, my background is in marine biology. So I'm a under <laughs> wahoo! Excellent. Uh, I'm originally an underwater dude, um, and we're just getting our first boat, which is very exciting for you guys here at CSUCI. Um, uh, anyway, so so I used to do a lot of diving. Then I went to UCLA for my PhD, and then I went up to Stanford for many years. So I, was, I left Stanford to come here and start this program. So at at UC, and so the equivalent program, kind of, there's nothing exactly, but this sort of similar program at UCSB. Probably students that graduate, and so sometimes people take the summer off. So let's say within the first four months of graduating, um, they're about um, probably about. 70% of those environmental science majors um, are employed doing some kind of environmental science. Not burger flipping, not folding t-shirts, but actually the stuff that we're trained you guys to do. At UCLA, it's way less, it's probably like 25%, because most of the folks at UCLA want to be doctors, so they do all this stuff, but they don't really, they're not really interested in going into the field. At Stanford, is a bit higher, probably about 70%. We're about 92% of our majors are employed within four months of graduation. And so part of it's because we're so diverse, because some are doing you know, drone stuff, some are doing education, some are doing you know, stuff with some local nonprofit or gov county government. So we're really um, lucky in that we are so interdisciplinary and so diverse, you guys have an option to figure out what, what you like to do most, and it sort of works out well. But the other thing, the thing that really distinguishes you guys, our graduates, is that your resumes are really fat. So even if you just took our classes, Right? If, you, if you just came to New Orleans as an elective, let's say, then all of a sudden your resume, you're boom, 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 you're like a wetland restoration in southern Louisiana, done. If you um, uh, do your capstone out at, at Santa Rosa Island, our research station, right? Oh yeah, did you know, independent research or ran a research project on whatever, Torrey Pine recovery in Channel Islands National Park, right? And so just doing the stuff that we sort of offer you guys as, as sort of the, the default option you're way ahead of most of your fellow students. So most of your fellow students um, aren't getting this kind of deep, you guys aren't embedded in the research and aren't embedded in the experiences that make you really attractive to the employers. So that's my, that's my pitch. There's never a guarantee, but, but we're, we work very, very hard at making sure you guys are, are able, are in a position to get um, a well-paying job. And, mo and most of you guys, is everybody local? Is everybody from sort of Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA, or people from farther away? Where? Um, I'm from Orange County. Okay. Where are you, where are you guys from? Yeah. Uh, like, 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 okay. Like, okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Sonoma. 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 Yep. Awesome. Cool. Sonoma, yeah. Okay. So increasingly, we're getting more and more students like you guys that are coming from outside Santa Barbara, uh, Ventura, Northern LA County, which is all good. A lot of you guys, you don't, you can do whatever you want, but a lot of you guys tend to like this area a lot. So a lot of folks, even if they don't come from Santa Barbara, Ventura, they tend to stay in our area, except for the, a lot of the robot folks go up to San Francisco and to the, to the Silicon Valley, the flying robot people, and the swimming robot people tend to go to San Diego. Um, that's where the industry is largest, but more and more we're having these companies starting up, and so more and more students are actually doing that same stuff right here in Ventura County. But, um, but I would say most of our students decide, hey, I, I like this area, I wanna, I wanna work around here, and they tend to look for jobs around here, but that's not, Everybody, that's not, some people go to grad school. So for the corporate, um, and this is Patagonia, what could you do for like that company? So yeah, so it all depends. So I'm, we're getting ready to write, a, uh, I'm writing a paper with a couple of my students right now, where, um, this isn't Patagonia, but it's another example. Uh, so they were interested in sustainability. So, so the sort of how do we make the buildings be less energy intensive and that kind of stuff. And so we're working with, um, uh, a local brewery in Ventura on beer because you know we're in college, so you have to study something like that. And so, um, so we were specifically looking at 
Um, we wanted to look at how sustainable the beer operations were, right? You think beer operations, what the hell, right? But, but they're using water, they're using electricity, they're consuming some amount of stuff and they're producing some amount of stuff. And so um, it got started to get really complex. We decided to focus in for the first year just on pesticides in their beer and microplastics in their beer. And so microplastics, we, we do a lot with microplastics in, in our, our lab. Um, and, uh, and so we've been studying those, those microplastics and sure enough, these students found this huge, this huge spike. So you start with um, water that comes in from the city, which might have a little bit of small, little teeny tiny piece of plastic called microplastics in it, boom, 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 boom. And, and then you add some of the, you know, <clears throat> uh, grains and everything, massive spike, like many orders of magnitude more plastic all of a sudden. And then when they go through the final process of pulling out all the, the mash after it's fermented and stuff, a lot of those plastics drop down. They don't go back down as low as before. But, um, so these students were just interested in microplastics and sustainability, and also they have this fantastic um, a training in how you assess microplastics. So Patagonia is really, really interested in reducing, so a lot of their clothes are synthetic, they have fleece and stuff like that, so they're really interested in how can we minimize our impact. So they've funded a lot of research on um, you know, different materials or, or stuff made out of hemp or whatever that does the same thing but doesn't shed plastics. So a lot of our projects are like that. So you guys might not work on a, a specific project that works for uh, whatever, an oil company, right? But maybe you learn with our drones flying around that you can use some of our sensors to measure leaking pipes, right? And so all of a sudden, this job opens up at, a, at an oil company, and you're like, I'd like to help you not have as much pollution coming out of your pipes or whatever it is, right? So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, we train you guys with these really solid skill sets, and then you can use them directly, do the same exact thing, or you can tweak them a little and be really um, uh, uh, desirous for a company or some stuff like that. Does that make sense? Other, other job questions? I think I have a couple more. Um, so these are just a couple examples. Um, these, are, these pictures are a couple years old. But, um, so Cassidy was one of our students. Um, she is from one of our local Native American tribes, and she was really, really interested in some of the medicinal plants and stuff. So she um, finished with us, went and just, just finished a master's at Northridge, and is now um, helping run a business um, that looks at medicinal plants. Uh, Reed is was be an example of somebody that does more of a traditional consulting firm job. So he does a lot of inspections when we're putting in new power lines, whatever he looks to make sure there's no endangered species around the area. Um, Lisa is um, was doing interpretive ranger stuff. She actually was um, down in San Diego. She's actually detailed up here during the Woolsey fire. So she's a, a, a fire inter um, like the person that talks to the media when the fires break out. So that that's. Her, uh, Travis, is up in a tree here, up in, um, up in uh, he's finishing, I think he just finished his master's in Germany. He got two masters because the guy loves school so much. Um, other guys, uh, she's finishing up, uh, Dorothy's finishing up her PhD at Oregon State. Evan uh, is now, works for one of our local water agencies. Stephen, um, which you can't see, is, his uh, head is covered up, but he just finished a master's in Utah, he does wildlife um, management. He studied deer. He actually studied um, sheep poop for his master's. Also, very exciting. Um, Adam works for a company back in um, New York. He's one of the few. He actually came from New York, so he was one of the super strange outsider dudes. But uh, um, yeah, so those are, that's just a little snippet. How much? We, we go to eleven forty-five or twelve forty-five? Um, twelve fifty. Twelve fifty. Okay. Cool. All right. So a couple unique aspects about ESRM. Um, I tend to think of it as an onion, and, um, and you need to be able to write. And many of you guys have horrible writing skills. Life's tough, suck it up. We're gonna make you guys better writers. So, so um, one of the trends we've seen at our, previous, at our sister campuses is more and more you guys are coming in less prepared, not, not great writers, not good with math and that kind of stuff. And so some of our sister programs, like some of those environmental science, uh, environmental studies programs you're talking about, tend to shy away from doing this stuff. We don't. We think you guys must be decent writers. And so one of the ways we do that is we embed writing in all of our classes. So you start out a little bit freshman year, a little bit more sophomore year, a little bit more. And <clears throat> whereas at places like UCLA, where I came from, we were systematically removing writing each year from having, having essentially the equivalent of you guys do less and less writing. No, 
you, you guys, whatever you do, any of those jobs I showed you, ranger, whoever, you're gonna be doing report writing and stuff, so you guys need to just work on those muscles, and it's like any other muscle. So writing and data, we just hired a brand new fact member, she's gonna be awesome, she's not here yet, she's coming from Colorado, she'll be here in about a month. Um, she's awesome, she's gonna be our new um, coastal data artist, was the job we created to search for. So her specialty is teaching you guys how to do kick butt graphing and data analysis and making statistics fun and all that kind of cool stuff, all using free open source software. So historically, we had to buy big expensive programs and you know, they're sort of permissions and they're kind of pain, but this new generation of stuff is open source. So you guys can run on your PC, you can run on your Mac, you can run on Linux, whatever. And her specialty is, is just being a data guru. And so, um, so we already have data analysis and graphing and stuff in most of our classes. Over the next two years or so, we're gonna be embedding that even more and more and more. And so it, again, not that we're trying to kill you guys, but a little bit every time, by the time you guys get to the end, you're super ready to do whatever you, the company or the county government or whoever wants you to do. So, so all of that is wrapped into our stuff. As I mentioned, we're really interdisciplinary. Um, we can't do everything, we only have a limited amount of time. Where we sacrifice things, we sacrifice a little bit of theory. So we're much more interested in teaching you guys how to do the actual skills. How do you use the 3D printer? How do you count the fish? How do you measure the carbon emissions from this thing? You know, very much sort of a how-to, 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 how-to. Um, uh, and so we're really focused on applied skills. Um, we're also really about deep community engagement. So not some BS thing people put on a, a, a flyer to make themselves look good or something they slap in a grant so they get some money. We actually, so my New Orleans project, this has been going on for 13 years now. Um, we started going to Cook Island six years ago. Um, I, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So, so we rarely do we go somewhere as a one-off and just sometimes do that, but usually it's building a relationship because we want to really understand these communities and we don't want to be this sort of parachute in and act like some macho dude or dudette and like, let me so, be so great. We're interested in having relationships with folks and really helping everybody come along in the understanding um, of whatever the, the issue is. So that's ESRM. Um, these are our current faculty. Uh, there's, there's, there's more than this, if you look at our website, but these are our um, folks that typically teach full time. And uh, uh, Mary, uh, uh, sorry, Mary. Uh, Emily Fairfax is going to be joining us from Colorado. Her picture isn't up here yet because we haven't taken her picture yet, but, but um, in a month and a half or so, she'll be up here. Um, Dr. Rodriguez and I were the sort of original folks, um, and uh, we, uh, Mary is a lecturer, Brett is a lecturer, uh, Linda is a lecturer, um, and then Kiki Patch is our, our next, after me, our next most senior person. Um, Dr. Steele, we hired after Dr. Pat, she's from the UK. And Dr. Reinemann, we hired two, two years ago, two, two or three years ago, I can't remember. Um, so everybody does something a little bit different. And so again, I encourage you guys to go on to ESRM Zone and check it out. So Dr. Rodriguez designs protected areas, designs parks and things like that. Um, and is particularly interested in how we get groups that haven't historically gone into nature. How do we get those folks in? How do, how do uh, uh, Latino families use urban parks differently than most white planners in downtown LA tend to think? Um, he works on how we get more buses and more public transportation to the beach so we can get more people using the, you know, free, freely recreating the beach. Dr. Wu is a chemist by training. And so she uh, worked on the Deepwater Horizon, um, as did I, and she uh, really works on um, oil, one of her specialties is oil pollution. Dr. Hartman grew up in Brazil and um, Peru. Um, he does a lot of ecological restoration stuff. Um, Dr. O'Heirich is a geomorphologist, so she studies how beaches and cliffs and things change and erode. Um, that's me. I, I do too much. I do. Um, you probably call me a conservation biologist. My background is all in biology. Um, Dr. Patch also is a geomorphologist, so she studies how beaches and things change and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, Dr. Steele is a fisheries ecologist by training, um, uh, and also is one of our uh, main leads on microplastics, uh, the microplastic pollution. Dr. Reinemann is our social, one of our social scientists, so he 
Um, he did his undergrad in marine biology, did his uh, master's in um, uh, physical geography, so oceanography type stuff in Hawaii. And then he went to Congress and did a lot of policy work for legislatures and then was a lobbyist for Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then he went and got his PhD at Stanford um, after I was there. But, um, but so he's interested in how we have different types of dialogues. So one of his classic projects he did was he, um, he's, he likes to surf. A lot of our people like to surf. Um, and, uh, but he's interested in having new conversations about things like climate change, as many of us are. So his tactic was to go and survey a bunch of surfers up and down the California coast, survey about 1,500 or so people. And then he uses his modeling skills to model what sea level rise is gonna do to waves. So in some cases, as the sea level rise, the waves will get better. In some cases, they'll get you know, more poor. And in some cases, they'll just change. And so he looked at it and he said, hey, have, let's talk about the cultural value of the coast, right? So you learned to surf. Who taught you how to surf? My dad taught me how to surf. Okay, cool. And, and where, did, where was that that happened at this, this point? Okay, cool. And then uh, who taught your dad to surf? Oh, my grandpa. Oh, your grandpa. Where did he learn to surf? Oh, here. So you can start to build the cultural value of the coast, right? How important it is for families to go for their you know, quinceañeras or whatever it is. And so, hey, this, this thing is important. And if we have this, this level of change in the environment, this is gonna change. This place where people have done their family reunions or whatever for you know, 50 years, whatever, is, is not gonna be available anymore. So he's interested in having those kind of conversations. Um, uh, and then Dr., uh, Dr. Fairfax, our newest hire, she is an expert in how uh, fire and water interact. And so she's worked on beavers a lot. She'll probably keep working on beavers here, but also other so-called keystone species. So we, so we span a bunch of disciplines, so physical sciences, chemistry, biology. Um, and so we're really, as I mentioned before, a very interdisciplinary problem, uh, program. So um, normally I say you guys should come to my office hours. I'm going to be on a thing called sabbatical next year. That means I'm going to be uh, traveling around doing stuff. So I will be around, but I'm not going to be teaching next year. We get to do this once every seven years, and so next year is my time. So Dr. Patch. Dr. Patch is our, will be our interim chair for next year. I will be around. But pop in to, you guys are welcome to come check my office if I'm there, but I'll, I probably uh, won't be. But pop into her office, I pop into anybody's office. And what I strongly encourage you guys to do, maybe not the first day of class, but the first week or so, first week or two, go to the, everybody will have their office hours posted in front of their door, even if you don't have them for a class. And also, you can also go to our administrative assistant. So if you don't know who's who, you can look on ESRM Zone. Um, she's just at the end of Bell Tower West, our administrative assistant. Her name is Alex Padilla. She's very nice. And just say, hey, I was wondering, can you tell me where, when Dr. Steele's office hours are, or Dr. Patch's office hours are? I just encourage you guys to plop, come on by, pop in for just five minutes. Even just to say hi, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm, an, I'm a new student here, really interested in, in stuff. and and do that, start saying hi to us so we know who you guys are. And the other thing is, I really wanna encourage you guys to start dropping into our labs. So you don't have to do this, but I strongly encourage you guys to start volunteering. So start volunteering, to show up, hey, I don't, I don't, I'm interested in microplastics, I'm interested in robots, I'm interested in pollution, whatever it is. Uh, can I, do you need any help? And I guarantee they'll say, hell yeah, we need some help, right? So, so all you have to do is a safety training. So our technician over in Sierra Hall will do very simple, like 20 minute safety training. Once you guys get safety trained, then you can start volunteering with, with any of us on, on any of our projects. And so that's what you guys really need to do. So one, that starts building up your experience in your resume. But then two, what does this do? Uh, it lets you know, is this really what I want to do? So sometimes we have, I have students that say, oh, I'm really interested in the wetlands and I want to work in the wetlands. Great, come on out with us. And they come out to the wetlands, I'm like, oh my God, this sucks. It's like all swampy and it feels weird and it looks weird and ah, it's not my deal, right? So if that's you, I wouldn't quit the first day because that doesn't look too good. But you know, after giving it you know, two, three weeks, but if it's not your shtick, it's all good. Go talk to your, to your professor, your, your person you're working with and just say, you know what, let me just think this wetland thing isn't really my deal. I think I might want to work on something else. That's cool. 
right? Don't leave somebody in the lurch. Don't tell them the day before they have a big three-day trip they're expecting you to go on. But this is your guy's opportunity to not just get experience, but to try on different stuff, right? One of the biggest problems I see with folks, um, some of our folks that don't volunteer with us, but also at other schools, is somebody says, yeah, I wanna, I wanna study wildfire or something. I'm like, okay, cool, and they go through school and they take a lot of wildfire classes and they read some wildfire papers and stuff, and it's all good, and then they graduate and they, and they finally get a job in wildfire. So, okay, great, they start doing it, like, oh my God, this sucks. Then you gotta pay rent, right? Then you gotta maybe have a significant other and all that, and then it starts to get complicated, right? Try it out now. Let, let's put our toe in the water and say, is this, I think I wanna work on boats, but maybe you start working on boats, you're like, oh my God, I'm deathly seasick, and this would be a bad career choice, right? It's all good. So you guys should be trying things, use, use our diversity and are, are doing so many projects to your advantage. And so, so you can work on multiple projects, but, but I really do encourage you guys to at least try a couple out and see is this, what is my passion? What, what is, maybe you really like water. Maybe you like working with animals. Maybe you like working more in the lab on the computer. Maybe you like, you know, whatever it is. And so we offer you guys the opportunity to do that, but it's on you guys to, to really come out. And so again, not the very first day or so, but, but you know, the first week, pop in and say hi to us. And, and come by our lab, it's second floor Sierra Hall. Um, it's just, you'll see it's called the Tech Lab. Um, and just pop your head in there, and Emily is, um, well, she's just, she just got married, so her name is, is legally gonna be changed. She's going on her honeymoon in, in a week or so. So after that, she's gonna legally change her name to Emily Gaston. But, um, uh, anyway, so, so just pop your head and say, hey, I'm looking to volunteer. Dr. Anderson said I should do some lab safety training and then you guys are off to the races. Um, so we're gonna be evolving our major in a bit, but right now we basically have two emphases, environmental science, resource management, they're not hugely different. Basically, this guy has a little bit more chemistry, really is the main difference. Um, uh, we're the only, well, we used to be the only major that had an outside advisory board, business has one now. But, so we, we really, we're really interested in constantly talking to local businesses and government and saying, Hey, are we training our are our students going to be marketable for you guys to hire? And if yes, which do they say it's great? If not, like you know what, you guys really aren't doing X. You should probably think about doing some classes or some modules on X. And so that really helps us. And we're we're getting ready to launch our masters uh, in what's called coastal sustainability. We also have a minor. We're really easy because we're so interdisciplinary. We're really easy to minor in because. You guys have to take a year of econ, a year of bio, a year of chemistry, so. And that's different from a lot of our majors. So, the general principles for you guys. Okay, I've been rambling on. Stuff you guys should, should note. So you guys should shoot to average 15 units per semester. So that means every single semester, you don't have to have exactly 15, but um, it, it's, uh, one of the challenges is um, a full-time student is considered 12 units. And some students see that and they only enroll for 12 units. That's a guarantee you have to go at least five years. And so, you know, if, you, if something goes wrong and you need a little more time, that, that's cool, but, but it'd be great. I, I want everybody to be on track to get out in four years. And so, so the, the average should be 15 units a semester. Um, ESRM is also weird in that our classes are variable. A lot of our classes are not standard units. So something like Spanish major or, or English, almost all their classes are three units, every, just about every single class. Ours really vary. Some are three units, some are four, some are five. And so, um, so typically, a 12 unit class, people would take, a 12 unit load, they take three classes, or excuse me, four classes, and then they get 12 units. You could take four classes and oftentimes hit the 15. Uh, unit requirement for us. Um, so your, your, your first step is our intro course is ESRM 100. So if you guys, uh, you can also test out if you guys took environmental science AP in high school, but assuming you didn't, which most of you guys haven't, um, you want to take ESRM 100. We offer that in multiple sections every semester, but let's get that done, you know, ideally in the fall, if not the fall, in the spring, and then be done with it. And then our next sort of lower division requirement is uh, so this is really intro, intro to environmental science. This is just sort of a broad introduction to a little bit about climate change, a little bit about energy, all that kind of stuff. Um, 200 is an introduction, and so you can take either 200 or 205. It's up to you guys, it's your guys' choice. 200 is our introduction to resource management. That's where we teach you guys about 
or, or, or expose you guys to trail maintenance and sort of more of the resource management stuff. That's taught in the spring only. 205 is introduction to sustainability science. And so that's where we teach you guys how to measure, you know, you know um, energy and, 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 and carbon emissions and stuff like that. And that's only offered in the fall. So you can, you don't have to take, you just take whichever one floats your boat or whichever one works better in your schedule. Um, my suggestion would be to take 205 if it, if it didn't matter to you. If you're just trying to pick one out of the hat, I would say take 205. I think it's more helpful. It's more unique. And um, so, as I mentioned, we're super interdisciplinary. There's only one other major at CSUCI that has more classes outside of their quote unquote major, and that's liberal studies. And that doesn't really count because liberal studies, you can just essentially take things wherever you want. But for like a traditional major that has guidance, we are by far the most interdisciplinary major. And so there's a lot of stuff you guys take that we don't teach. Year of bio, year of chemistry, with the chemistry department, the bio department, econ with the economics department, political science with the political science department, that kind of stuff. So I would encourage you guys to get um, your stuff that's not ESRM. And we have a new roadmap that should be up. If it's not up, it'll be up in a couple weeks. But um, um, uh, your, your, ride, your, your first year ride requirements, that kind of stuff, focus on getting that jazz done in your first two years. Then, so primarily we send you guys out for the first two years, and then we really get you your final two years is how our major is set up. And so when, you're, when you finish that lower division stuff and you're ready to start doing the upper division, the, the, the two foundation courses I want you guys to start with are 328 and 313. 328 is our Introduction to Geographical Information Systems, GIS. So we teach you guys how to make maps. Um, and then 313 is, is uh, Conservation Biology. That's a cross-listed class with biology and us. And that's, and that's really where we teach you guys about reading scientific papers, writing scientific articles. That's sort of like the intro to the rest of the, the science stuff. So if it absolutely doesn't work out, with the way your schedule plays, that's okay, but this is really the ideal. Take 328 and 313, um, say the start of your junior year. And so um, I would say, which course do I take? First, I would focus on ESRM major classes and when you're building your schedule, and then fill in when you have a gap or so, you can fill in your, the, the GE requirements, your art requirements or your whatever. There's many more options for GEs than there are for our majors. So, so this is the more restricted one. So I would, I would start with our major requirements and then do GE. Um, and then, like I said, uh, you guys should come by the lab, start volunteering. We have students in the lab all day long at nighttime. Not that you guys would be there at night, but I'm just saying, that's, you know, that's really where you guys build your relationships and, and your friendships and all that kind of good stuff and really start to get in deep into the science and deep into the training and really get that passion for, for doing stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about this, but it's pretty hot in here. I don't know, I don't know how much you guys care. We, we, have, we also have other things. So we built in classes specifically to help you guys with stuff. So a couple things I'll just mention. Um, ESRM 301 is uh, uh, field professionalism, and we've created that to get you guys credentials. You guys had questions about certificates and things of that nature. So this is really designed, it's a one unit pass no pass class. You can repeat it up to three times. It's not, it's not in the requirements, so it's not, you don't have to take it. Um, but it's really, really helpful. So for example, the traditional class that we offer is Wilderness First Aid. So you sign up for it, it's one weekend, eight hours Saturday, eight hours Sunday, and when you finish up, you have a two year wilderness first aid certification, a national certification. So that's great training. It's, it's one that's just great for you guys all the takes. We do so many field experiences, so you know if you twist an ankle, you know what to do. But it's also cool that you get a card. So once we get our boat arrives, we'll start having a class on how you guys drive the boat and how you safely tie up the boat and all that kind of stuff. So this is really a sort of generic class that we just plug in different experiences into. I mentioned uh, three, and this is offered fall and spring. 328, I mentioned the intro to GIS, that's also offered fall and spring. This is a really key one before you, just, you don't have to, depending on the research, but it's really, really helpful for a lot of the research. Um, our field methods class is only offered in the spring. Um, we, so we have this ESRM 370s, this is the introduction to drones. People call it, it's called introduction to remotely piloted systems, but we do underwater robots, but that's easy. The flying is what, 
FAA gets ticked off about and everything. So, so the flying is more challenging. Um, I, it says spring here, we've just changed it. So now it's only offered in fall. So um, I encourage you guys, if you're interested in that, you can take that. And part of the classes you guys have to take, it doesn't guarantee you pass, but, but we have a very high, like 90% pass rate. Um, you, to fly a drone, um, we, uh, we can just fly them. You guys in our classes, you can, I can give you a drone, you can fly it if you're in a class. If we're doing research, you guys can fly a drone, no problem. If you're trying to do it for money, so if you guys want to go work for a consultant or make some money on the side, you have to have what's called a Part 107 certificate from the FAA. It's just like a driving test, you have to do a written test. Um, and so we can't give that to you, it has to be given at an airport and, and the official testing center. But um, once you have that, you're good to go. And so even though we don't need that, we require all of our pilots to have that. So, so that it's just another great certificate you put on your resume and you also, yeah, thanks. And so it's also really a great thing to have. Um, just in the back, even if you don't want to do drones for research, but you want to do it for some other thing, take pictures of houses for real estate folks or whatever, it's a great thing. Um, that class is moving to fall, so this is in the fall. Um, and we have some other new coastal contaminants class, but um, we can talk about that later. I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Um, key thing is going to be to manage your time. So one of the things that I've found, and I've been talking so much, I'm going to stop right now. But one of the things, um, a lot of you guys have to work at least part time to pay for school, and there's an expectation that you guys can have a social life, and that you guys can work, and that you can do well in school. And the reality is, you pretty much can do maybe two of those, two of those. And so having a, a crazy ass awesome social life and working all the time means your academic stuff are gonna are gonna take a hit. And so. So just think about that as you guys are planning out your schedules and all that kind of good stuff. So I've talked on way too long. You guys got to go in five minutes. So uh, questions, you guys have questions for me. Yeah. If you want to do environmental science major with a focus on marine biology, what classes do you have to take in order to go So we'll, we'll probably, by the time you graduate, we'll probably have a new emphasis in coastal management. But um, uh, ESRM 462, our coastal management class, coastal contaminants, um, so when we say coastal, we define the coast as the part of the ocean that's directly influenced by the land, and the part of the land that's directly influenced by the, the um, sea. So for us, we consider that a whole a, a unified system. Marine biology folks, they just look at the marine side of things. So there's a few classes in, in the bio department you can take, um, but mostly there would be various options with us. So a lot of our classes, you, for example, you can take one of your intro classes, you can take geology, a couple of geology options, or physical oceanography. You should take the physical oceanography. So just about everything, there's an emphasis, uh, and I can answer specific ones, but um, uh, physical oceanography would be one you can take in the fall. Did you go? Other questions? Yeah. yeah? So how do we know what cl classes we should like, take this coming year? Yeah. Um, Right, so, so you guys are gonna be enrolled in some classes already, so some of your English and your math, so that'll take part of your schedule up. Next, if you, I would suggest you guys do, like I said, those requirements, one, you guys run 100, and if you're interested in doing the 205, I would, I would sign up for the 205 this first semester. So that, that would be my suggestion. So you really have to have 100, not before taking every single class, but, but 100 is sort of the key one to get you into most classes. So I would focus on 100 and the two, well actually it's 205 that's offered in the fall. So 100 and 200, 205. And then you'll be full this first semester. Okay. And then come by, not, not the first week, but you know, like second, third week, then come by. We have the whole year planned out in terms of what classes we're offering. Come by Dr. Pash and say, hey, I know it's early, I just want to, can we talk about what's going on? We'll also have the roadmap will be up too that'll say, hey, we, if you're an environmental science emphasis, we suggest you do these classes, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. So 100 and 205 for this first semester. Other than that, just work on your GEs and your other writing and basic stuff. Anybody else? All right, cool. Thanks, you guys. Sorry I talked for so long. Um, you guys are welcome to pop by my office anytime. Most of our offices are in Bell Tower West. This building is called Bell Tower. So in this, in this hall, if you walk all the way down there and then go out the doors and you kind of walk out the doors and step about 10 feet this way and go in another set of doors, that's called Bell Tower West. All of the faculty 
our offices are in there. So if you guys ever want to look for us in the fall or whatever, come by there. Awesome. Thanks, you guys.